Okay. Um, so I think uh, I think I'm about ready to start. Um, so uh, welcome um, to the town hall discussion on PFAS, the forever chemicals that have been used in everything from nonstick frying pans to firefighting foam. We have a terrific panel of speakers here tonight, people who are experts on the compound, how they pose a threat to our health and what can be done about them. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event, the Conservation Law Foundation, the Audubon Society of Rhode Island and Clean Water Action, as well as state representatives, Terry Corcoran and June Stephen. My name is Alex Kuffner, and I'm the environment reporter at the Providence Journal. Before we start the conversation, I wanna talk a little bit about how I got to know the issue. I first started reporting on PFAS in 2017 after the University of Rhode Island opened a center to study the chemicals in partnership with Harvard's Chan School of Public Health and the Silent Spring Institute. I had read Nathaniel Rich's story in the New York Times the previous year about the health crisis caused by DuPont's pollution and drinking water supplies in a West Virginia town, which became the basis for the movie Dark Waters. The PFAS issue seemed interesting to me at the time, but not necessarily one of significant local concern. Rhode Island doesn't have any major manufacturers that use PFAS on a large scale. There are no active military bases in the state where firefighting foam has been used on a recurrent basis. So I really thought that I'd write about the new center at URI and be done with the matter. But it turns out that around that same time, testing by Rhode Island authorities found PFAS in levels above federal recommendations in the aquifer that serves some three dozen wells in a corner of Burrowville. They traced the contamination to improperly stored firefighting foam at the local fire department. And all of a sudden, the problem became very real in Rhode Island. It would take nearly two years and cost more than $3 million to find a new water source for the Burrowville neighborhood. Continued testing found the presence of the chemicals in drinking water supplies in other parts of the state. About half of the 87 systems tested had at least some PFAS traces and a dozen had as much as 20 parts per trillion. If that sounds like a small amount, it is. One part per trillion is about equal to a grain of sand in an Olympic sized swimming pool. But because the chemicals are so potent, 20 parts per trillion is considered by many to be the upper safety limit for drinking water. None of the supplies testing positive for the chemicals had levels as high as those in Barlville, and none were above what the EPA advises. But that may offer little comfort because researchers are finding health effects from even minimal exposures. With the failure so far by the federal government to take action, states are stepping in by passing their own laws to stop PFAS contamination in drinking water. Rhode Island is among those trying to do something. Over nearly three years, environmental advocates have been pushing for a statewide drinking water standard that would be stricter than the federal guidelines. State legislators have sponsored legislation to achieve that goal, but so far, the bill has not progressed, and efforts by the Raimondo and McKee administrations have also stalled. It's been more than a year and a half since a senior official of the Rhode Island Department of Health said that regulations were imminent. Meanwhile, moves to restrict other sources of contamination are also gone slowly. Legislation to ban PFAS and food packaging also hasn't won passage. This all comes as a host of other states have passed strong rules. And all the while, new findings emerge about the dangers of PFAS. They're in makeup. They're believed to be in some face masks that people have been using during the COVID pandemic. And scientists at the URI Center recently found them in air samples taken from offices, homes, and classrooms. The chemicals are literally in the air we breathe. Let me now introduce our expert panel. We have Dr. Rebecca Altman, a sociologist and author who lives in Providence, who has, ex who has written extensively on plastic pollution for the Atlantic and Orion magazine, among others, and has a book coming out on the subject. Terry Gray, acting director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. He is an environmental engineer who has been heading up the DEM's efforts to address the chemicals. He's also leading the state's efforts on climate change. Dr. Lauren Richter, Assistant Professor in the Department of History, Philosophy, and Social Sciences at the University of Rhode Island. She's a sociologist who studies social, uh, sorry, not the University of Rhode Island, at the Rhode Island School of Design, my apologies. She's a sociologist who studies social inequality, health, and the environment. And Dr. Angela Slitt, Associate Professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Rhode Island. She's a toxicologist and is part of the PFAS Center at URI that I mentioned earlier. We're hoping to have a casual conversation. So for our panel, even though I'll be asking questions, please feel free to jump in at any time if you have any comments you want to add, or if you want to ask any of your fellow panelists questions. So to kick off, I think it would be good to have some basics what PFAS are. So I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Rebecca Altman. Can you give us a quick history of PFAS and when did they come into use and what were they used for? Sure. 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you uh, to the hosts for having me. Um, I actually began studying PFAS as a graduate student at Brown in 2005 um, and have been at this for quite a while now. Um, but the history of PFAS goes way back before that. Um, I first began studying PFAS because a community down in uh, the mid Ohio Valley area was was, had it discovered in their, in their water supply. And this is the community whose story was told through the film, um, Dark Waters. Um, and at the time it was in the water supply. And when I got down there, it had just been found in, in, in human blood, except um, doctors, regulators, scientists have been caught largely off guard um, by what had appeared like an entirely new class of pollutants. Um, but it was an entirely new class of pollutants to industry. These materials had been in use for over a half century at that point. Um, as uh, you know, in my own research, I've been particularly interested in what has driven this class of chemicals into the economy uh, and then thereby into the environment. And when I started pulling on that thread where it landed me is in an unexpected place where I found myself was deep inside the archives for the Manhattan Project. Now, you might know the Manhattan Project as the government, um, uh, the government project during World War II to figure out how to build the atom bomb. So the basis for nuclear technology, but uh, what many people do not know is that this was also the, um, the beginnings um, of both um, the research and development for fluorocarbon technologies, what later became PFAS, and also for Teflon. These were all research grade um, laboratory entities at that point in which government money helped spur along development and know-how to figure out how to scale and industrialize these materials so that these materials could make the factory that could go on to then make fissile material for the bomb. Um, so I, that, that, that has been the basis of the work that I have done. And I find it very interesting because I think there's a public mandate here, which is that if the United States was very much involved in um, helping bring these chemicals about for national security reasons, um, and it wasn't just private interest developing them, then um, the imperative for, for government action is all the more. So, so we see that you know there, there's a long history here, and eventually they went from the origins that they've made it sort of into industry, sort of consumer products. Um, Dr. Angela Slick, could you tell me why why are PFAS harmful to people, and and how are we being exposed to them? Sure. Um, so to answer the first question, they're harmful to people. So can, first of all, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so they've been associated with, with health effects such as thyroid disease, uh, elevated cholesterol, low birth weight, um, decreased response to vaccination, and certain cancers like kidney cancer and testicular cancer. Uh, but really what's the biggest concern is that many of them have a really long biological half-life within the body. And so what that means is when the body takes when you take them in, it can be through drinking water, it can be through um, food products, it can be through meats and, and fish, um, but, but mostly it's through water. And um, anyways, the, the concerns is that it has a very long half-life. Um, for PFAS and PFOA, their half-lives in the body are anywhere from about four to 15 years. So that means that the 15 years would be on the long side, but typically four to seven, four to eight, somewhere in that range. So that means it takes your body that many years to get rid of half of it. So these reside in the body for a long time and it's very challenging to get rid of them out of the body once someone's exposed. And just as a follow-up, again, Dr. Slit, what, what, what do they do to you once they're in your body? Okay, so once they're in the body, they're thought to, again, act upon the immune system, potentially also act upon the liver, and they also kind of, um, that's really the, the main issue at the moment. There are issues with potential disruption of thyroid hormone and the thyroid um, function. Okay. Dr. Lauren Richter, when were the, the negative effects from PFAS first discovered, and, and what has the chemical industry done about them since these negative effects, these harmful effects were discovered? 
Yeah, thank you so much for the organizers and um, for the question. So um, tying back to what Becky was mentioning about this early contamination discovery in um, the Mid-Ohio Valley, there were a series of large scientific studies that happened looking at the health effects of PFAS exposure um, that were dramatized in the film, Dark Waters. And so around 2011, 2012, 2013, the C8 science panel started publishing peer reviewed journal articles linking exposure to certain P PFAS compounds like PFOA mm -hmm. to um, certain carcinogens and other adverse health effects. Um, so really the puzzle um, that my collaborators started with when we looked at this starting in 2015 was why is there so little being done about PFAS given that peer reviewed journals were publishing um, linking right exposure to PFAS to adverse health effects. And by also by 2015, we knew from um, Center for, Centers for Disease Control biomonitoring that um, PFAS were found in the majority of, of human blood sampled. Um, and so uh, I can post some articles that uh, my collaborator, collaborators and I have written about talking about this sort of uneven discovery of the problem of PFAS and kind of who knew what when. Um, and as uh, Becky mentioned, right, the chemical industry knew about um, some of the behaviors of PFAS compounds in the environment and in appearing in, in the blood of workers for a decade. So, yeah. So these are these are compounds that have been in use for for generations, many many decades. Yet we didn't know about, or at least the public did not know about the health effects until the past decade or so. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, um, I would say that the case in West Virginia with the uh, the cattle die off on the tenant farm was really you know a high level of exposure cattle die off and so it's sort of like through impacted communities and here through animal bodies sort of like an adverse health effect so obvious that you start that individuals started asking questions and trying to connect the dots and unfortunately this has been a pattern with PFAS contamination so in Hoosick Falls New York um, I believe it was around 2014 2015 a local teacher was concerned about high levels of cancers that he was seeing and was trying to link that um, to the St. Cobain facility there. And so we see this pattern of sort of community discovery through observed adverse health effects, which for my collaborators and I, we are, we're asking, why is this happening? Why is this a route of like knowledge production? Um, and, and what does that tell us about how chemicals are regulated in the US? Right. Terry Gray, um, so you know we've heard about what industry you know knew beforehand, how the public has sort of learned about this. What has the government response been like? Um, you know, tell me about the federal response, um, and then what what other what states are doing, including Rhode Island. All right, thanks, Alex. Um, good question. I think uh, I think our history of learning about PFAS really kind of mirrored your understanding as well when you started researching this. At first, I heard about PFAS, um, primarily PFOA and PFOS, the two, the two biggies that started this in the regulatory world, through discussions with our regional partners, um, primarily in New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire. They had big contaminated sites that impacted large stretches of groundwater in those, um, in those states. When we, they were focused on a particular company, a particular industry, as well as some, as some military facilities. And we were cautiously optimistic that we didn't have that company with a big presence in Rhode Island, and we didn't have that big military presence that we, we were really concerned about. Um, turns out we were wrong. Um, we were definitely wrong. When we, had to, when we started to really dig into PFOS, we started to see a lot more sources of contamination and, and a lot more places where it would show up. But to get back to your question, in terms of regulatory actions, the uh, EPA came out with a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion for some of the concentrations of PFOA and PFOS. And many states started by adopting that. But then states that had a lot of capacity, particularly in toxicology and, um, and looking at risk assessments, came up with their own standards. And they saw, like had been spoken about earlier, that, that the, um, the real safe levels are much lower than 70. 
and and they probably extend to more types of PFOS or P, PFOA um, than uh, PFOA and PFOS. Sorry. So so now different states are really all over the place with respect to developing um, drinking water standards for this. A lot of states have come out um, with various combinations of chemicals summed up to around 20 parts per trillion. Some are below, some are above. I think I think it. It's kind of a mess of standards, to be honest with you. And part of that is due to the failure of the federal EPA to really step up and, and do something about this. The, uh, the EPA standard setting process is extremely bureaucratic, extremely regulatory, and takes many, many years to get something set up. It's just not nimble enough to handle a class of chemicals like this. And and, uh, and it really hasn't been able to do that. They're still fighting yesterday's war, to be honest with you. They're still looking at PFO and PFOS. Well, look, we've moved on from that. We're looking at a much broader range of chemicals and we need to regulate well beyond that. And it's gonna take a long time to catch up with industry on this. You, you mentioned, you know, as you started answering this question, you mentioned that, that you know, when, when these tests were done at drinking water supplies, that, that um, the contamination was much more widespread than, than you thought. Can you just, you know, I summarized this a little bit in my opening, but could you just give us some more detail about that? Yeah, most of that work was done by the Rhode Island Department of Health. Um, they worked with Brown University in partnership to get out and, and really come up with a sampling scheme to look at our public water supplies. And as they went through the public water supplies, you mentioned that they identified a um, public water supply in Barville that was contaminated, um, the Oakland Association well. Um, that was our first big PFAS response. And that was above the 70 parts per trillion um, advisory level. So we had, to, we had to work with the health department to come up with a, an alternative water supply for those, those residents in that community. Um, we also had to find out where this came from. And that's where DEM came in. And we investigated, the, we investigated the aquifer, we looked at the site, and we found out that the source of the PFAS was from a leak of firefighting foam into a floor drain, into a septic system, and then polluted the aquifer. So it, this was kind of a new route of exposure, a new source that we weren't really expecting. But since then, we've, we've seen it. Um, a few times that have come up, and it's not just firefighting foam. It might be floor wax. It could be um, it could be personal products disposed in our landfills. It's um, it could be textile treatment facility tre textile treatment chemicals like like uh, stain resistant or or, um, or waterproofing materials. It's um, it's quite a diverse source of contamination. Um. Angela, you've testified in favor of a drinking water standard in Rhode Island. Um, do you think that, that the Rhode Island government is doing enough to regulate PFAS? Uh, wow, that's a tricky question. Um, I, I would hope that they can do more. Uh, I, I agree that there should be standards in place for, for PFAS and that there, that there, should, be, um, there should be standards. This is, we're playing whack-a-mole right now. There are more chemicals than we can keep up with mm -hmm. and they're not being necessarily engineered to be um, any less toxic. So because there are thousands of them, I, I do think this is something we have to tackle and we can't ignore. So uh, I guess on the record, I would say, yes, I, I, I would like to see the Rhode Island legislature and the state of Rhode Island do more. I think it's, I think it's, for the safety of our people, our ecosystems, um, everything. These, these are chemicals incompatible with life. They're just, how can we break them down? It's, it's just, it, it's very tricky, challenging. You mentioned this, this whack-a-mole approach. And I think Terry sort of, you know, uh, pointed to this too, where we we pick out individual chemicals or individual compounds in the family, but we're not regulating them as a class. Are you advocating for regulating them as a class? I think right now we have to, un unless we can really find safe alternatives. So, you know, I, I guess for me, uh, in my expert opinion, I wouldn't necessarily say that we, that we should 
completely forgo every fluorinated chemical that's out there. But right now, the ones that are getting put out into the environment um, often are just have just the same types of properties as PFAS and PFOA that have already been banned. And so the issue is there's no reason for me to think that on a biolog biological level, they're really going to behave any differently. So I don't think we, with so many thousands, we really have any other quick strategy other than to consider them a class, unless there's some exception to that class that we find is actually not bioavailable, doesn't bioaccumulate, um, is fairly safe in rodents. And I don't think that the field is there yet. It, it really takes a lot of people working together, but when you have so many thousands, um, there's just no way to get through all the toxicology testing needed to regulate every single one. It, it, we can't even detect all, we don't have standards for all of them. We just know that they're out there. So, so Lauren, you know, does that, does, doesn't that point to a much larger problem about how we regulate the chemical industry in general in this country? You know, where, where we let, you know, these companies put these chemicals out and then if we find problems, you know, after the fact, we regulate them. I mean, do you think that we should be taking a more proactive approach? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I can post a link um, in the chat to a blog I recently wrote with Alyssa Cordner and Phil Brown that's based on an academic article we wrote talking about how the Toxic Substances Control Act um, exacerbates, in some cases, ignorance, scientific ignorance about chemicals in use. And we tell that through the story of PFAS, um, looking at the design of TSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act in the 1970s, and asking sort of who was at the table, who was at the table writing that law. And through sort of some archival work um, and, and interviews with different um, stakeholders, looking at the chemical industry had substantial influence on the shape of American chemical regulatory law. And in my research, I was doing interviews with scientists working on PFAS in the present, and many of them were saying our hands are tied by TSCA. Mm -hmm. Chemicals um, can rapidly go onto the market with like voluntary data submissions on um, uh, ev evaluating their effects. Um, and then once chemicals are in use, so many of them aren't regulated. And once we're finding adverse health effects, it's really hard to pull them off the market. So the question that we examine in this paper is like, why, why would this task look the way it does? It doesn't have to operate this way. Um, but decisions were made in, this, in the 1970s that in some ways are setting us up to be in this situation where we're discovering, um, we're discovering and experiencing these crises. Um, but it's not like everyone um, is experiencing them in the same ways. And so I'll put a link to that article where we're looking at sort of the ignorance experienced by communities making discoveries of this. The, in some ways, the way EPA scientists have their hands tied by the law and aren't able to access certain information that might be claimed as trade secret protected by chemical companies, and the ways that industry exerts a lot of power and discretion with regard to what information they're providing or withholding. And so really drawing attention to power and how different stakeholders are positioned. And I guess a takeaway being, you know, thinking about who do we want at the table writing our laws? And do we want um, you know, stakeholders whose primary interest is public health or protecting the environment and being precautious or stakeholders who are trying to sell chemicals? There, there, there have been moves afoot to reform Tosca or at least strengthen it. Um, but I'm assuming you'd argue that they haven't gone far enough. Yeah, unfortunately, as Angela mentioned, a lot of the new um, PFAS that are coming out on the market uh, appear to have similar properties to the ones that have been phased out. So again, drawing attention to chemical industry discretion um, with regard to um, shaping the solutions to the problems that they caused. And so thinking about like, how could we um, bring in and empower uh, regul regulators um, and scientists um, at, at state federal levels um, to really be shaping um, and evaluating um, chemicals before they're going on the market. And that I think that from my understanding in interviews um, with folks working on this, that's still a large, a large challenge. Rebecca, can you just, um, I want to step back a little bit. Um, you know, I think we can keep talking about the details for a long time. I think we can return to that. But I want to step back and just look at sort of the broader context of this. Um, you know, when we talk about PFAS, you've also you've done a lot of research into plastic pollution and fossil fuels and, and you know, how it's all sort of relates to climate change. And I just wonder if you could sort of put this whole discussion about PFAS in the larger context. Yes, um, I'm happy to do that. I, 
there, there's one there's one way that that let me enter here through this. We've been talking about PFAS as a class. And I just want to point out when you when you go back and you look at how originally, well, let's call them fluorocarbons to begin with, because that was the language that was used in the 40s and 50s. When <clears throat> uh, these these were uh, um, compounds that were produced as a class, um, they were produced, you know, and like when when popular mechanics reported on this in the early 50s, they talked about the the um, process of electro um, uh, electrochemical fluorination. It was this very unimpressive, no more unimpressive than a bathtub vat, which was how they were produced. They were produced uh, multiple different um, uh, chemicals at once, right? So you, you have this kind of stew produced and then those would be kind of siphoned off and separated. And then, and this is an issue across the, the petrochemical sector, not just with, for, for example, 3M developing this, is that the marketing teams and the research and development teams were tasked with being as inventive as the scientists were. So we have a new class of chemicals, new individual chemicals, then um, the marketing and, and, and R&D departments were tasked with inventing markets for that. And so you have these entirely new class of chemicals produced. And for example, I have a headline here, Popular Mechanics 1952 wanted job for a trillion new chemicals. I mean, we maybe know about 10,000 right now, but the idea from the get-go was that this was this is the, the, the kind of the mathematics of how this kind of chemistry works was going to produce a lot of different variants. And so now you can see them fan out across the economy. And that's how we have this weird assortment of uses from like pizza boxes to flame retardants to makeup. To, you know? So it's like that, that's kind of by design how this industry works, whether it was 3M or DuPont or I study Union Carbide, which is a company where my dad worked. I mean, that, that kind of is kind of how chemical development works. Um, so anyway, to regulate that in a backwards way is an incredibly difficult task. Um, and not just backwards, like backwards by like half a century or more. Um, so um, that was kind of, that's, that's kind of one way to frame it. Um, but the other thing to talk about in terms of what World War II did was to put a lot of money into laying down the infrastructure to not only develop oil and gas, um, but also to lay down the infrastructure to then convert the byproducts of oil and gas development into a whole new array of synthetic pro uh, products or to advance the research and development of products that were already emerging. Teflon is one of them. Teflon is a fluorinated plastic. It was already invented, but it was like made at grams at a time. Manhattan Project money incentivized DuPont. Hey, can you do this? You know, churn out tons a year. Um, the same with polyethylene. The same with polystyrene. The same with synthetic rubber. That you know, I could go on and on about how um, wartime investments helped kind of deliver us into a petrochemical economy now. So, so if it's spread. Again, a follow to, to, to you, if it's, if it's so widespread throughout the economy, it's in so many products, how do, we, how, do we, how do we move away from that? How do we get them out of those products again? Is there a way? Mm. I was having an interesting pre-conversation with um, Dr. Lauren about the emerging ideas about public oversight into what's called essential uses. Um, which is an area I'm just starting to pay attention to, but I think Lauren is watching a lot more of how do we have these conversations um, as a globe um, into, um, uh, into this question of, of the essential uses, which is a, a kind of a, also happening in the plastics world as well. Um, mm -hmm. that are there public mechanisms involved for, for ferreting out um, when these chemicals are consumed deemed of, of relevance to public welfare and, and what are expendable uses, um, bearing in mind production, <laughs> production technologies that turn them out en masse and often in combination. Terry, um, I want to get back to, to, to Rhode Island and the Rhode Island regulations. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't have a drinking water standard yet in Rhode Island. Um, why is that? Well, the health department um, is probably best positioned to answer that question, but they have gone through a lot of analysis on that, including a cost-benefit analysis. 
and they've got a recommended standard that needs to go through the regulatory process. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's up to them to um, to get through that regulatory process at this point. Um, in addition to drinking water standards, there are a lot of things that that DEM has planned as well. Mm -hmm. um, one is a groundwater standard. So, so you know you want to you want to protect people before it gets into drinking water. So, um, so we have intentions of promulgating a groundwater standard that would be, would be driven off the science that the drinking water standard is based on. Um, we're also looking at a surface water action level. I'm not gonna call it a surface water standard. There's a little regulatory distinction there that, that's important to, to us, but, um, but it would be a number that if we found PFAS in, um, in surface waters, we would, we would take action and fix that. Um, the other piece is, and this is a big piece, is to declare certain um, PFAS compounds hazardous substances. Mm -hmm. Usually this is done at the federal level, but we can also do it at the state level as well. And what that does is it establishes um, a broad range of regulatory authority over those compounds, including liability for pollution for those compounds. And you talked about how you can, how you can change behavior and how you can fix a problem one of the one of the ways that's worked historically is is ultimately by making the people that are responsible for pollution responsible for the costs of cleaning it up okay. and that hazardous substance determination and definition is really important to do that so that that's something we're looking at as well um, there's also there's also issues related to soil and and biosolids and by biosolids, I mean the residuals from wastewater treatment. So uh, this, this has become a, a big problem because a lot of biosolids are looked at as fertilizers or soil amendments, and then they're spread on the ground. Right. And if they have contamination in them, then, then that, that creates a new um, route of exposure. So like I said, uh, the more we learn about PFAS, the more, the more things we're nervous about, the more things we're worried about, and the more things we're, we're looking at regulating. I would like to add one thing that just building off what Dr. Slit said about, about regulating these compounds as a class. We've done this before. So um, the, the entire country regulated a class of compounds called polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs as a class. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of analogies to this in the chemistry world that instead of different um, types of PFAS, they had different aerochlores or forms of PCBs. And rather than testing them all and setting them standards for each individual aerochlore, we set action levels for the class. And this is important because it allows us to regulate this stuff in a, in a realistic manner. And, and ultimately you can set a standard, but you have to set up a regulatory system to apply that standard. And if that's too complicated, it's not gonna work. So, um, so looking at these as a class or as a limited number of classes, I, I really truly believe is the way to go and to set, set some standards on that and then implement them in a sort of a general way, I think, would make it realistic. And that's not something that has to be done at the federal level. I mean, states are doing this, correct? Yeah, states are doing that. But you need, when you talk about state actions, you kind of need an economy of scale, right? You need some... You need some big states with, with strong staff capacity, strong toxicology um, capacity to kind of set the science background that others can, can act on. We all have our own regulatory processes that we have to go through, but we can manage that. What we need is the defensible science to base that as a foundation for those regulatory processes. And, and it doesn't matter who develops the, the science. It could be New York, New Jersey, California, um, it could be the EU, who knows, but, um, but we, can, we can take that science and then use it as the basis for a um, for regulatory system at the state level, or EPA could do it at the federal level, either we've way. Men we've mentioned federal and states. I mean, is there a role for cities and towns? Again, I'm asking you, Terry. Not, not, it, it would be unusual for a city and town to, to, um, to enact a regulatory program like this. But a lot of times the cities and towns are the impacted entities. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that are running the drinking water systems that, that may be impacted by this contamination. And maybe they they're the ones that are, um, 
are paying for the remediation or are suffering the damages from the contamination. So even though they're not regulatory, they may have a they may have a cause of action to take action on something like this. Okay. Lauren, um, Terry mentioned you know the regulation of PCBs as class. Um, are there other um, sources of pollution, other chemicals, or other pollution sources um, that that we've regulated um, that that may hold lessons for us with with PFAS? Um, another example that comes to mind for me is um, the Montreal Protocol and the response to CFCs, um, chlorofluorocarbons. <laughs> I may be saying that wrong, um, but um, you know that was a class-based response with a you know a group of, of chemicals with a with a global threat. So I certainly see that there are there is precedent for taking class-based action, um, and yeah. Um, I think thinking about PCBs as well is, is a good example. Okay. Angela, um, you know, if, as an individual, you know, I'm hearing about this and, and it, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I, I see some of the studies, some of the new findings, and it's, it's scary stuff. Um, but one, I guess, how worried should I be, again, as an individual? Um, and, and what can I do about this? Okay, so I don't, I, um, I wouldn't want to alarm the general public. I, I think in general, um, Rhode Island's water supply levels are relatively low. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't know. So some of the C8 studies were from highly exposed populations. So to give you just an idea, those populations had almost a thousand times what our general, uh, our, the public, the American public and in, in, in Haines data we see. So those were um, much, much highly, much more higher exposed individuals. Um, now, as far as what you can do, there's a few things. So you can install um, Brita, like any sort of activated charcoal filters can filter out some of the PFAS, not all of them. So the higher chain PFAS like PFOA and PFOS will get removed with activated charcoal, but we know that activated charcoal doesn't capture all PFAS, especially shorter chain, or I believe more neutral PFAS. Um, now, with that said, when, when um, there have been studies where they've looked at the um, addition of activated charcoal filtration to public water systems, and have, have observed um, PFAS levels in the individual, you know, the average PFAS levels in the individual's um, blood levels declining over time. Uh, with that, now with that said, aside from that kind of adding some sort of filtration step to your water, um, honestly, another way is, is to get rid of the chemicals. So for example, the US populations, serum levels of PFAS dropped dramatically um, once PFAS was removed from the commercial market. So part of it is that we, we do have to do something on a much higher level, but for individuals right now, I would say one tactic would be to um, filter your water. Um, but maybe some of the panelists, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go on, you are. Oh, I was just gonna say, maybe some of the other panelists can also speak to this too. Please, anyone jump in. I just want to say with filtration and other technologies like this, you have to be very careful with this because chemically they will, re or, or physically they will remove the chemicals, but they also fill up with chemicals over time. And, um, and as they fill up, they can provide a false sense of security. Whereas you think you're safe, but the filter is actually saturated and the chemicals are coming through. So the tricky thing with filtration is you really have to monitor it at the same time to make sure it's working. And that gets expensive. And most, most um, private homeowners won't do that. Uh, a drinking water system will do that, but, but uh, private homeowners won't. So I would caution that that is, is something that you should be careful with. I mean, so doesn't that mean that the more efficient way to take care of this is, is in the drinking water system? Absolutely. But, but we do have people that are on private wells, which are their own little drinking water systems, and they have to be careful too. And, and I know DEM has spent, spent time um, working with them on filtration systems and monitoring techniques, but, but it's something that has to be carefully maintained in order to keep your family safe. Yeah.
And, and I'm hopeful, honestly, in the next five years or so that we will come up with better filtration tactics as well. The, the field is really working aggressively to mitigate PFAS and come up with um, materials that can filter them and remove them from, from water. Uh, it, the genie has been let out of the bag. So realistically, um, you know, there's two ways to tackle this. One is to kind of not let it ever out. And then the second way is obviously to deal with it through filtration. But Terry brings up very good points in that uh, it's expensive. And then you have to worry about whether or not you're maintaining the system that you that you're using in a way that's keeping your water safe. Rebecca, um, after, you know, we sort of discovered so many things, or the general public has discovered so many things after the fact about, you know, the harm caused by PFAS, um, how has the industry responded? I mean, what, what's the chemical industry doing about this now? I am most worried, mostly a useless backwards looking historian type of person. I've okay. been <laughs> mostly okay. going in the wrong direction. Um, although I will say, I mean, I, uh, I think maybe Lauren probably has the better perspective on what's happening. But I, on this, I follow what the journalist um, Sharon Lerner reports uh, at the outlet uh, called The Intercept. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of chemical swapping out, of, you know, trying different formulations um, and still pushing for voluntary control. Um, we also see a process at the United Nations level for how to think about uh, these as well and, and, and attempts at influence there. Um, Lauren, let me toss this at you. What, do you, what, are you. what are you saying? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, to be honest, I think it's a hard term for us to wrap our heads around um, what the chemical industry is doing. Um, and we can think about different decades um, um, of, of strategy um, and different relationships, right? Like what Becky's pointing to with the US government and military. Um, I think that um, what we saw after the discovery in Parkersburg and the litigation um, in the sort of um, mid 2000s and late 2000s was the EPA and industry devised this voluntary PFOA stewardship program where there was a voluntary phase out of certain PFAS by industry. And in 2016, when I was doing a lot of my um, interviews for my research, folks were saying like the problem solved, we're done, like we solved it, this is great. We can, industry can just voluntarily, you know, use their discretion to come up with a solution. Um, but of course, um, the story continues to evolve and we're seeing like the, the class of PFAS in use are growing and growing and growing and there's so much ignorance around what, uh, what's out there. I think that just coming back to what I started with, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around industry strategy. Um, mm -hmm. I would say industry was at the table shaping the nature of regulation in the 1970s. Um, there's substantial industry lobbying and funding of politicians. Um, there's this idea of regulatory capture where we had a, Andrew Wheeler was a, I believe chemical industry lobbyist who then became the administrator of the EPA under the Trump administration. Um, there's substantial industry um, influence and revolving door inside the Environmental Protection Agency. And that was going on before um, the Trump administration. Um, there's influence over the peer reviewed literature. Litigation on PFAS has shown that there are academics who are hiding the trail of money from the chemical industry and can, sh can help sh that can shape what's published in peer reviewed journals. Um, so it's hard to get our heads around, um, I think the power of corporations in the United States right now. And something I keep coming back to is thinking about like campaign finance reform, like are there ways that we can get private interests out of, of government um, and have folks who really can prioritize um, public health and public interest and not feel beholden um, to companies. Uh, that's something I come back to is thinking about conflict of interest um, and, and ways we can sort of protect um, government entities from, from capture. One thing I'm curious about too is, you know, we've seen with some other industries as we crack down on certain things here in, in the United States, you know, companies are sort of exporting those, those products to developing countries. Are you seeing that with any of these companies that manufacture PFAS? Yeah, 
PFOA went overseas um, after DuPont uh, took it out of the Teflon process and moved a different chemical in. Um, there's also that move that um, you know, DuPont moved, kind of sold off its Teflon division, which had been using the PFOA chemical, became another company called Chamars. I don't know how to pronounce that, um, but folks on the ground tell me it's supposed to rhyme with tumors, but I think that just might be them trying to spin it. <laughs> but anyway, um, and then, you know, Dow and DuPont merged, and then they spent some time together, and then they shook their divisions up, and then they split off into three new companies, which is called New, new Dow and New DuPont, and then one other company. And if you ask DuPont about it, well, that's New DuPont, not Old DuPont. And so that this like liability issue, even as things are shuffled around, it's like, it really is a difficult shell game to follow. And these things are all changing names, not just corporate structures. You know, it's like it used to be called PFCs. Now they're called, you know, PFASs. Before that was CA. This, you know, and so it's like very difficult to track as a you know the public to track what's going on. Yeah. So we've got we've got a couple of uh, questions from the audience here, and people it looks like people are really interested in in you know water and you know uh, sort of the, the individual impacts on them. So, um, you know, one person is asking here if um, filtration systems will work for um, shorter chain compounds. Um, and then someone else is asking about, you know, PFAS and bottled water. Um, so Terry or, or Angela, I don't know if uh, either of you guys would like to answer that, those questions. I could take a crack at the filtration one. Um, okay. as, as you, you know, one of the things that that's been going on as, um, as we regulate these compounds one by one, the manufacturers have been going to shorter chain compounds, which is referenced in the, in the, uh, in the comment. Um, with shorter chain PFAS compounds, they, they, they can be less toxic, but in a lot of ways, they're an unknown. We don't have the data on, on those compounds to really understand how toxic they are, but they're also more difficult to filter as, as the comment says. Um, that doesn't mean you can't filter them. It means that you have to go to more technological extremes to, uh, to take them out of water. And you have to go to uh, filtration tech technologies like enhanced activated carbon, um, you know, like a reverse osmosis system or e even an eye exchange system to really get at this. All of these adds, all of these add costs to getting clean water. And, um, and it also really kind of enhances the need for that monitoring that I talked about when we're going through the comp, going through the, uh, the filtration. So yes, it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that I think we need to keep an eye on and really keep studying to find out the efficiency of the different filtration technologies as these new compounds roll out um, from, from industry. Um, Angela, do you want to talk about bottled water? Sure. Um, so uh, I, there have been studies on bottled water. Um, it, it, for example, there's a consumer reports did a study where they looked at about 47 different uh, types of water. And thankfully, actually, most of those did had very, very like less than one part per trillion um, PFAS, but they did uh, find a few that did. So thankfully, um, from that study, that was good at the national level. However, what I would say is that there's not really any regulation right now for local bottled water sources. So it's really, I think, in some ways, you're kind of, you know, spinning the die, rolling the dice. There's, there's just, you don't know what. Terry, do you? Does anyone else want to jump in on this one? I'm not a real Alex, water I'll expert, help. but I'll jump in a little bit. I know the health department tested the sources of bottled water. The bottlers in Rhode Island, and they were they were okay. Um, there was also there was also an issue with a bottled water company in Massachusetts that was um, was found to have PFAS contamination in their product, and that was that was quite a, a scramble for a while because that that company distributed bottled water all across New England, right. and and each individual state had to take action through their health departments to really to really get that stuff off the shelf. And, and, and we had to act in unison so that, so that the last one in the, um, the last one working on the problem wasn't, wasn't the one that had all the product, right? So, um, so we, were, we were trying to work um, hand in glove with our neighbors to, to get that taken care of, and it was. So it is, 
it is a tricky problem. Um, you know, a lot of the health department people, the drinking water people say the safest drinking water that you can drink is, is the kind that comes out of your tap when it's tested and regulated effectively. And, and, and sometimes bottled water doesn't have that same rep level of reg regulatory oversight. So we have another question here from, uh, from you know, an audience member. They're asking about um, private well owners. And so I'll just read the question. Um, how, how can private well owners test for these chemicals? And if, if those tests show high levels, are the results automatically shared with third parties, possibly hurting property values? That's a tough question, Alex. Um, for a private property owner, you could test your water for PFAS or really whatever contaminant you, you suspect might be there, um, but you have to do it at your expense. And, um, and that, that can get expensive when you're starting to, to look at a, a big suite of contaminants, if you will. Um, if you do find stuff, I don't know about your, um, your legal obligation to report that or to deal with that. I'm not, I'm not sure where that, um, where that sits. I know with other contaminants, a lot of times that um, if a private well owner gets contamination in their well, they will report it to us because they want to know where it's coming from. And we'll then investigate the source and we'll try and try and help them out with an alternate source of water. And obviously, if your water supply is impacted, that's going to have a tremendous value on your property or an impact on your property value. So, um, you know, a lot of times we will sample people's private wells at the state's expense if if the private wells are around something that we're investigating as a source but we just don't have like a blanket program to go out and, and offer people free well testing. We just don't have that capability right now. Okay. I've got one more question. Um, I can throw it out to, to anyone here, but it's sort of just a big picture. You know, we, we've talked about state actions. We talked about the EPA. What's Congress doing about this? Are, are there moves afoot in, in Congress to try to do something about PFAS on the federal level? Anyone can answer that. I, I can answer this a tiny bit, which is I think that the EPA is, it seems like they're gearing up to do work in this area. And I can say that because there have been a lot of panels that are being formed. Um, I just know from various academic friends, including myself, of, of now being asked to serve on different panels that are covering a lot of these issues. So I, I get the sense that the EPA, that, that there will be some movement. and. Um, documents that I know I had been a reviewer for that were stalled um, are actually going back and getting re-reviewed. So there was about a year and a half where they were stalled and nothing happened. And now, and then once there was an administration shift, um, we started getting asks again to start reviewing documents. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful. So um, Senator, Reed, Senator Reed was driving some um, activity on this in the defense, defense appropriation bill last year. And um, I don't think I don't think the PFAS language really ended up in the final uh, past bill in the full force and effect that it started with. But but what Congress was doing, I believe, is is pressuring both EPA and the Department of Defense to take action to deal with this stuff. And it, it hasn't come to the point on the federal level, I don't believe, like it has at the state level where there's been bills that have been proposed that actually set a standard. Right, that hasn't happened at the federal level, but I think there have been um, there have been efforts to to push the agencies to to get their regulatory wheel turning, if you will. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm going to go to our host in just a second, but before I I do that, I just want to you know take one or two minutes or just give people one or two minutes an opportunity. If, if anyone wants to say anything, anyone wants to make any sort of comment before we wrap up. Um, I'll just sort of open it up right now before we uh, before we start to wrap up. Hey, thanks for the opportunity for us all to be together and have this conversation. No, thank you all. It was uh, it was a it was a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Um, so I think what we're going to do is uh, we have uh, representatives Gene Speakman and Terry Courtfriend here, uh, so they co co sponsored this. Um, and just wanted to, you know, recognize them and if they have anything they'd like to like to say. Terry, are you there? Yes, I'm here. There we go. Okay, okay, you go ahead. 
Yeah, I just want to thank the uh, our speakers, our panelists tonight, and thank you, Alex. This has been a fascinating discussion. I certainly learned a lot, even though June and I have been working on this for several years now. Um, I think tonight was very informative. And I would just like to echo that. Thank you, Alex, and to the panelists. Again, the more we know, the more effective that Terry can, and I can be as we craft legislation and, and try to move it through the process in the coming year. And we need all of your help, uh, the experts and the advocates and the public and the journalists. So thank you all. I think we're going to turn it over now. Back to you, Alex, or over to John and Michelle. I'm going to switch it over to, uh, to James Crowley of Conservation James. Law Foundation and uh, Michelle Bowden um, at Clean Water Action. And they can, uh, they, can, they can talk a little bit, too, about what they're doing. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'm James Crowley, and I'm an attorney with the Conservation Law Foundation, uh, and we're an environmental nonprofit. And for the past few years, we've been working to try and establish standards for PFAS and drinking water uh, in the New England states. And I just have a few th quick things to say before we wrap up. First, I want to direct your attention to the chat uh, where Michelle shared a link uh, that she's going to tell you a little more about in a minute uh, that has more information about what you can do to help make sure that Rhode Island addresses PFAS. Um, I just want to briefly thank June and Terry, not just for co-sponsoring tonight's event, but also for all of their work on PFAS over the past several years, uh, including sponsoring legislation to protect Rhode Islanders from PFAS in our drinking water and our food packaging. Uh, and I also want to briefly say thanks to Clean Water Action Rhode Island and the Audubon Society of Rhode Island for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, PFAS is a really important issue to all of our organizations. Um, and in fact, PFAS has been named a legislative priority for the Environment Council of Rhode Island, which is the umbrella organization of all the environment groups in Rhode Island. Uh, so now I'll just pass it over to Michelle. Great. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, thank, thank you so much um, to all the panelists and to Alex and also to everyone who um, took the time uh, tonight to tune in. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, you know, we these these groups and um, you know representatives have been working on um, this issue for a few years, and you know we believe that 2022 is uh, the year that Rhode Island is going to take action on PFAS. Um, and you know other states have led the way, and it's, it's time for for Ro Rhode Island to make some moves in the upcoming year. Um, so definitely want to encourage folks to take a look at the link that I've shared, and um, you know take action to send a message to your elected officials, our elected officials here in Rhode Island, um, you know, to just to just to make sure you get the word out there about how important this issue is to us. You know, that's how we make change is people raising their voice and saying, I care about this. This is important. Um, so a chance for you to do that um, through that link. You could also send something uh, privately um, you can tailor the message as well. Um, and if you'd like to get further involved, um, I put um, my email address and also James's email address. He does work for uh, Conservation Law, Law Foundation, not <laughs> Clean Water Action. Um, so make sure you use the right email address. Um, and um, yeah, we, we'd love, love to have the help in the upcoming session. So really appreciate it. Appreciate everybody coming out today. I'll turn it back to Alex. Um, well, I think that's, uh, that's about all we have tonight, um, but it has been uh, a, a really interesting conversation, um, and I uh, just want to thank the organizers again, and um, just, just to remind everyone that new information is coming out about PFAS all the time, um, and so I think if you're interested in the issue, um, to keep monitoring the news, um, and also um, to keep monitoring what's going on at the state and federal level because um, you know regulatory efforts are are, are changing all the time. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's just where I'll leave it for tonight. Um, but thank you all. Okay.